Hello, 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 and welcome to another episode of the Full Quota Podcast. This is your number one cricketing podcast in South Africa. We talk all things South African cricket. We bring you incredible interviews. We are going to be talking about the Proteas. They're in England playing that third test, doing whatever they need to do to get through. But this week, we've announced the SAT20, Tim. We've announced fixtures for the domestic season. I didn't even know that we're going to be aggregating, giving points across all three formats. And if you're going to get relegated, you need to be good at all three, essentially. Uh, We're going to talk about all of that in the coming weeks. But Tim, you always have a way of getting the stars on the show, getting us South Africa's best and brightest cricketers in the country. And today, Tim, you have a very interesting guest for us. I know that he averaged 452 last year with the bat in in, 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 in four-day cricket. Am I thinking who you've brought me? Because that's all you told me, Tim. <laughs> um, so, uh, with the season coming around and a lot of sort of pre-season videos starting on Instagram, I thought the schedule would be a bit clogged up to try and find players to be available. And I didn't want to interfere with their pre-season training. Um, so I got somebody who's just come back um, from America in his time there. Um, so it'll be very interesting to see what he, what he has to say. Ooh. As you rightly point out, in his four seasons at the Dolphins, only once has he not averaged uh, 40 or above in four-day cricket. So he's really, he's done exceptionally well at the four-day stuff. He's now knocking the door down in, 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 in America, Did, had a good season there. Um, his former Issa and the 19 player, Marcus Ackerman. Oh, yeah, let's have a mind, Tim. I'm excited for this. One of the more exciting young batters in South Africa. Hi, Marcus. How are you doing? How's it, Paul? Tim, how's it going? Uh, yeah, thanks for, thanks for having me today. Uh, really appreciate it. Cool, cool, cool. The only difference between me and you uh, is that I think you're a Saints boy and I went to St. John, so I'm a little conflicted here, but it's fine. We are more than happy to have uh, you on, 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 this, on this podcast. Um, Marcus? Um, yeah. as, a, as a proud Saints boy, um, I won't go into depth with that topic, so we'll just, uh, yes. we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Look, I think last weekend, Saints just went crazy on St. John's. And if anybody's watching this, there's a kid named Richard Salazzani. My word. My word. What a joy to watch. Um, uh, but Marcus, let's start there. What got you into cricket? I think it's very interesting to hear people's stories, but like, how did you get into the game of cricket? What made you, yeah, just start playing? Um, I think my dad was, uh, he was a cricketer like throughout his, you know, when he was, you know, growing up and stuff. So cricket was always in the family. Um, my grand then ran an indoor facility, uh, like a action arena when we were younger in Horizon View, which is in Rudderport in Gauteng. Mm. And uh, growing up, I was you know, around people playing action cricket all the time. My buddy used to play club cricket and, you know, Premier League in, 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 uh, in, in Johannesburg. And, uh, yeah, so around, the, around cricketers all the time, uh, next to the field, people throwing to me. And I think that's where the love of the game really started, where I was playing all the time. Um, and, yeah, I'd probably say it was at a very young age, you know, probably like three, four, five, six years old. So, yeah, that, that's probably where the love of the game probably started. That's great. You- yeah, I love it. Yeah, love it, love it. You, um, you, you made those earlier teams fairly early on, didn't you? You, you know, you made, you made the sort of Gauteng, um, provincial sides. Um, so how, how was that? Was that, uh, a, a good experience? Was it good grounding for what was to come later? Cause a lot of guys, they, they get rushed into, or, or they, they are late bloomers, but you seem to have found a, a, an, an in, if, if you say, at the beginning and never really like, you went through all the, the stages until you became a professional cricketer. So did that help, having that system to, to, to find uh, a level of cricket and then to go through to the next level? Sorry, Tom, I really struggled hearing you. I need, I need a little bit of that. Um... 
I don't know. Your signal looks Dude. to be quite good. I, I'm struggling with yours. Can you maybe repeat? Um, yeah. Uh, did the fact that you made the provincial sides help with the grounding as you as a cricketer? Did it help making Gauteng provincial sides sort of at, at, at under 15 level as, at a young age? Did that help you in your, in your way of going in, in cricket? Um, if I, I heard half of it, but I, just correct me if I didn't hear all of it. Um, you're asking if um, making provincial teams at a young age helped the pro progress of getting into a professional team and the environment. Is that what you what you're asking? Okay, mm. cool. Yes, that's what yeah, I'm saying. I, I think I think it's such a big like. I mean, if you go look at any of the domestic players or any of the international players at the moment. They would have all come through the ranks somewhere along the line, um, playing uh, under 11 provincial tournaments, 13, 15, 17, and then eventually into under 19. Um, I think it was such a great initiative, or if you want to say a great uh, part of the pipeline, that I'm not actually 100% sure if it still happens. I'm assuming it does. Um, because it's just so important because you might be the best in your in your in your school and then you become you play provincial cricket and then you're the best in Gauteng uh, I'm speaking as an 11 mm -hmm. and then going into you get to play against other teams from you know different provinces and that that helps you like rate yourself in terms of where you are at as a player and where you want to become or you know playing against the best in the country so that, I think that's such a big like learning curve and starting to at a young age starting to to know what's required to become, uh, you know, the best player at your age group. Um, mm. I feel like if you if you don't get to experience that, you won't really know, you know, who to measure yourself against. Um, I think that's what makes it so important going through the various stages at a different age group because it does help you, you know, if you don't have a good under 15 year, you know where you have to be to be able to, to be better when you hit under 17 level. And then vice versa when you go up towards under 19. So it's just a good benchmark. It helps. It really does help you, you know, personally to know where your game's at and where you have to improve on. Um, when did you realize you could actually make money out of this game? Um, and then on top of that, um, the jump between under 19 and professional. How was that? Um, money wasn't really a thing when you're younger. You just want to play. We watch our Euros play for South Africa, and you watch your. I remember going to domestic games and watching the Lions at the time playing, mm. and I could name every single player that was playing. And you know, <laughs> that's where the love for the game, you know, developed. It was more the love of the game and wanting to play on this at the stadium. That was the the dream. Um, not really the money side of things. I think once you start getting older and you you start earning the money, it's you know, it's obviously vital because you have to put food and stuff on the on the table. So it just, you know, that's it's obviously your job. So that's obviously you get to live your dream mm. and earn money while doing it. So I think that's obviously just a bonus and, and you know, such a luxury. Um, yeah, I think the, the jump from under 19 to professional, um, it was quite a difficult one because it wasn't smooth sailing. I had to go to varsity straight after under 19 level. And had to go study first and and play the game, you know, um, mm. at university level, club level, and then go through the ranks slowly until I broke through into the northwest system, where I played a little bit of first class cricket. Then for them, when I was only 20, 19, end of my 19, 20 years old. So yeah, that's pretty much the the gradual increase that I had to do. I mean, I remember playing. It's under 19 and then playing third team at the club or at the university when I started as a first year. Mm. And then, yes, it progressed quickly into second and first team and playing varsity cup and club champs and all of that. So, your know, university tournament. So, that's that's how the, the you know, that, how can I say, the pipeline took me. Um, mm. I didn't really straight go into provincial cricket from under 19 level. But did that, did that help you, uh, that journey? help you because i think the big question on on everyone's lips is trying to be able to there there's some kids who get there straight away but there are others who go through the journey and so um obviously everyone takes it differently but like when you got to provincial did you were you happy yeah. you did, did your 
I think your 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 journey helped you there to be like, okay, no, I know yes. that I'm not. Honestly, I think it's really important um, to go through those pipelines because it does, t- um, you know, the game a little bit more. It helps with um, learning your trait. Um, your, you know, like we all have talent, but it's grooming mm. the talent into becoming consistent and, you know, learning like as a player who you are and what you want to achieve when you do make that step up. Sometimes when you make that step up too quickly, you're actually not ready because you're not used to that intensity and the level that the guys are at. So it can, you know, you can get caught wandering. And I mean, there's only mm. a couple of players like KG and Quinton the Cock. I mean, two players there's obviously a lot more that can make that jump straight away because they're just so talented and so good um but the rest of us i felt could really help because you learn your traits and you learn the different levels of cricket and the intensity gradually increases which then helps you as a player to find out where i have to be and then when you do make that step up that you are ready i remember making my t20 debut in 2017 i think i'm not i could be wrong i think it was 2017 and I remember that I was definitely not ready. Um, I, was, I was ready because it helped me going back down. Or when I then, you know, when I left that environment, I knew what I had mm. to work on and where I had to be to be able to perform at that level. So, um, did it help me um, going through the ranks? Uh, and it took a couple extra years. Yes, it did definitely. Yeah. Well, if last season's to go by, it really did help because you were just really good last season. Yeah, yeah. It's always, always, always interesting to hear that the, the fact that you no, know, you're not not the first person to say that 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 it's important to have some kind of grounding um, before you go to the next, you know, the the, the, the ultimate level of professional cricket. Um, what about playing at Northwest? Because when you played at Northwest. That was a really strong side. You had Rasa van der Tissen, you had Vernon Lipper, and you had guys that who, no, who are now purchased players. They weren't then, but they were obviously good players. So what was it like to play with guys that were proper professional seasoned cricketers in, at, at Northwest? Yeah, look, I was so grateful that uh, the coach at the time was Monty Jacobs. Um, I think he was a brilliant coach in terms of getting the best out of each player. He was a he could manage a, each player in a in a way, uh, and and give them that sense of freedom that they belong and that they can that you can go and express yourself and announce yourself into you know provincial cricket. Um, it was really nice to have that support from the coach's side, uh, especially at a young age when he just started, and and, and having guys that I remember Rasi Yanuman. Um, Oh, just name a few and fourteen. We had a couple really good players, uh, Vian Libba. So we had a, a couple of really good players that were coming through the system with us. And, and and the nice thing is we all had the same goal. We all wanted to become, you know, uh, franchise cricketers at the time because we were only playing semi-professional cricket. And we had all. And I think because we're so competitive naturally as sportsmen, we each like got the best out of each other because everyone wanted to play franchise cricket and we all wanted to do really well. And we were in an environment mm. where doing well and excelling and being the best was was that was our culture back then when we were younger um, at Northwest. And we played hard and 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 we had a lovely team. I mean, I can't name every single person now, but mm. we had such a great team, a great team environment, and yeah, it was uh, it was awesome. Uh, it was a uh, it was a really great experience in terms of molding me as a cricketer going forward. Mm. Um, yeah, look, that semi pro team had a lot of big names. Um, m- let's move on to to your Dolphins, the time at the Dolphins. Um, how did that come about? And yeah, look, you've had a great couple of a few years there, and that team evolves. You went on to. Uh, win the CSA four day challenge, uh, but you represent them across all three formats. But like, how did that opportunity come about, and like, how's how's the environment that side uh, compared to the previous ones you've had? Um, it was obviously a lot more uh, professional in terms of the intensity and stuff going uh, going into a franchise system. Um, I remember speaking to Andrew Stratum was our current CEO. He was the CEO at Northwest at the time. And I remember playing 
uh, a Coastal game. He was already the CEO uh, for the Dolphins. And I played a Northwest game against Coastals. Um, and I remember scoring a century. And mm. just I was like in between, you know. I didn't really know where I was going. Was I going to go into the franchise system with the Lions? But they had a really good team and a, a lot of season campaigners playing at the time. So it wasn't easy to break through into that system. And there was just a little bit of a gap maybe at KZN. And I remember Heinrich coming to me saying, would you be interested in moving down to the coast? And, you know, maybe trying to pursue something at the Dolphins. And I remember moving to the Dolphins and they had a star-studded lineup. I remember uh, there was Mornay van Weg, Vaughan van Jaarsveld, Dane mm. Villas, um, just to name a couple that were in the, you know, in that, in that lineup. But they were coming towards the end. Um, mm. and, and, you know, I remember, you know, Vaughan, I still played with Vaughan, moved there and Mornay for one or two seasons. Mm. But I had to wait my turn. I remember going there playing Coastals, uh, still semi-pro cricket for a season. And then I only broke through into the Dolphins and, and getting a contract there. So it was a bit of an indifferent, like, uh, path or route to get to franchise cricket. But uh, it's been an awesome experience. And, and what a lovely uh, franchise. It's run really well. We've got great sponsors. We've got a great team. And, and honestly, uh, the results speak for themselves. We've got a lot more international players coming through the Dolphins in the last season or two, which shows mm. the quality of players that we have at the Dolphins. Um, I think which is really cool. And I think about two seasons ago, just before the Forte campaign, we really worked hard on our culture and wanting to you know, not to be a franchise that or a, a province now that just that's just always there and that can cause upsets, but become a team that's dominant at franchise level or at the uh, division one level. So, mm. and I think in the last two seasons, you know, we've played in a lot of finals, we've won a couple of trophies, which is which says a lot about the team and the coaching staff and the changes that we had to make as a as a franchise. Awesome. Um, last year we we interviewed Saul Irvia, and he, he was in the in the Proteus camp at the time. He hadn't quite made the the debut yet, um, but he was saying at w exactly what we're just saying. The environment of the Dolphins mm. was so was so comfortable. You know, not not in a bad way, but everybody was in a single minded with the same goal, the same the same plans. Everyone was going in the same direction. So, what is it that makes Imi Khan such a good coach? What is it that he does within the Dolphins that makes you guys so successful and a, and a happy camp? Because from the outside, you also thought you seem like a happy bunch of players as well as being successful. Yeah, look, I think he had to make a change. Um for us, you know, he, he took over and uh, took over from Grant Morgan, um, who was an awesome coach in his own way. Um, but then having taken over, uh, and, and Imran Khan was the, the assistant coach at the time, so he knew, when he took over, he knew he had to do some things different and do it his way and make sure that he makes it a success. And I think the biggest thing that makes him so, such a good coach is he didn't take, um, he, he set high standards, and he didn't take a no bullshit policy. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, professional as possible. We're going to be the fittest team, and we're going to make sure that uh, we enjoy each other's company and we work hard. And if we make mistakes, which is which is human, uh, we take it on the chin and we move forward. We're not going to make excuses for when we don't do well. And as cricketers, you you know you fail a lot, so you got to learn. To, to get over that failure quickly and make sure that you get, you know you can you can make success or try through the hard times quicker than, than other players um, and I think he really helped us do that you know what I mean uh, and, and, and at Tapton he really gave me free reign and drive that high intensity and the high standards that we wanted and and and, and in part of we complemented each other well and we still do so I think that's such a good coach and, and being someone that played for such a long time at the highest level and being out of the change room really recently, it does help a lot because he can relate to players. 
you can relate what works and where the game's evolved to. So I think that's really important, especially uh, someone that did play at the highest level as well. So he knows what is required, what's required to become a successful team. He's, I'm sure he's been in team environments that haven't been good, and he's been in team environments that have really excelled. So I think any day of the week you want to have a team or a culture that... Uh, that pushes in the same direction. And uh, as the Dolphins, we've got a very diverse team, um, culturally and, um, you know, um, race. So mm -hmm. uh, we complement each other well, we speak about things and we've really gelled in terms of respecting each other's boundaries and respecting the environment and change room. Um, and I, I think in our culture and respecting each other and each other's space. And, and you know, it's starting to know each other. And, and, that, and that really worked for us. And I think that's still something that we have to work on daily and that we still work on every season because there's still areas that we can improve on a lot. And he drives that and the team is bought into what he wants to achieve. And I think that is, that is key. Yes, um, I think that's really important that Dolphins setup is, um, has, 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 has changed the game in South African cricket. Uh, over the past couple of years, I think if you look at the Titans and the Lions, they had the little ambit where the trophies were sitting and then the Dolphins just comes and steal everything. Um, but that's a good thing. It's a good thing. And Tim, we're hoping Western Province comes through sometime in the next couple of years. Um, Marcus, at the start of the season, like last season, let's look at last season. Did you have any goals that you set for yourself? Or is it just, uh, I just want to play the best cricket that I can? And it, at the start of every game, do you have any goals? Do you... Are you that type of a cricketer who watches stats or you just want to play the best cricket that you have, that you can? I think cricket is a stats game. So you've got to, I think every single player is aware of it. Um, but I think the longer you play, the more you don't really focus on that. You, you more, more the task at hand. Um, I, I do set myself goals all the time. I think uh, it's difficult as a professional sportsman not to set yourself goals because then you can get comfortable and then you can get caught wanting because players around you always improve and they want to improve uh, and they lift their game. When you play against guys, uh, you, you know, they try um, make sure that they improve and, and want to make sure that they, uh, you know, if you did well last season, they're going to you work you out and try work on different areas to get you out. And, and you know, that, that's just professional sports. So it's not setting goals. You really, you know, that wouldn't be... Uh, an ideal thing to do, but uh, I do set myself goals. Um, I think there's a lot of things that I still want to work on. I'm still improving every day. Still a lot of things that I want to improve on. Uh, still really learning and uh, you know trying to find out exactly how I want to play my game. I've still got a lot of areas to improve on, um, but it's getting there. And uh, I think my four-day ca uh, campaign was really good, but I've still got a lot to work on in my in my white ball cricket. Um, I think. Uh, it's just a little area that I'm really focusing on going into the new season. Okay. Just to give a, a, a bit of a background for people who don't know, you averaged 52 last season. With, <laughs> uh, so that's you know, really good numbers in, in terms of average last season. Um, for me, this is the, the most interesting part of the interview. Uh, a few weeks before the tournament started at the minor league uh, competition, uh, I'd heard a rumor that you were going to America. I contacted a friend of mine there. He said, yeah, it's happening. And um, so obviously I, I was gonna, gonna watch a few games. I watched last last year's. Um, I, like the, I like the fact that the game is growing in places like that where they have the infrastructure in terms of certain places. So talk to us about how that happened. How did you, going to minor league championships in America. How did that come about? Um, you know, it was quite interesting. I was, I was planning on going to the UK for the UK summer. Um, I then unfortunately was finishing my degree, so I couldn't go over at the time to the UK. So I then finished uh, uh, Calvin Savage, who was my ex-roommate and teammate in South Africa for the Dolphins. He was playing, he's moved there permanently and he's playing for uh, a Chicago team. And he contacted me and he said, listen, are you available? Okay. 
Okay. Uh, um, so, and he contacted me and asked me uh, if I'd be interested between this, uh, you know, time frame to pull through. And I said to him, you know what, I've been wanting to maybe do a little, you know, go play a little bit of extra cricket in the winter. Um, and I literally just finished my degree. So I was like, okay, I'm definitely going to consider it. So I then, with a somehow trying to get a visa and, and uh, getting through all of that process is uh, I managed to get my visa in time and managed to go over to the minor league as a wildcard player, which is a, an overseas player. Um, so each team's allowed, uh, there's 24 teams and each team's allowed a wildcard. Um, America's really big. Um, there's a, there's a lot of players. Um, so it was a great opportunity and I felt like I could go and you know, play a bit of T20 cricket and and really find out I want to play my game and, and, and go find out, you know, like just play a lot of T20 cricket because at the moment in domestic cricket, we don't play a lot of games. We um, mm. we used to play a lot more back in the day. Um, nowadays, we play seven first-class games um, in a season, which is mm. sad. It's quite sad in a sense because we do, don't play enough cricket. But then we also play a lot more white ball cricket which is a good thing and a sense as well because that's like pretty much where the game is going. Um, so I felt like I needed to just work a little bit on my game, especially just playing 2020 games. I think I worked out, I mean, I only got back on Friday. I was there for about nine weeks and I played about 27, 28 matches so, of T20 cricket. So from club cricket to, to minor league cricket, um, I played a lot of games, which was really good. And I think uh, there was a lot I can take out of, you know, my trip over there. Um, they've still got it. I mean, it's only just starting out to catch a bit of for me over there. Um, I think their facilities aren't up to scratch just yet, but as a first world country, and there's a lot of investments and money in that country, so I'm pretty sure that it will, it's going to take off at a rapid pace. Um, uh, it's, it's really a promising cricket's going in the right direction there, if I can put it that way. Yeah, there's a T20 league that's about to come up around the corner that has that that that's going to be in America that everyone wants to play in, um, and I think you've done you you've done you've done well to put yourself in that little radar because I think it's 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 it it's the next frontier for the ICC, and I think if if they can have India and America consuming cricket, it will change the game for everybody, and and I think. That that's what's going to happen. Um, you mentioned something in in in, the, in your last response about not playing enough games. What did you what what did you make of the the the, the change in the domestic structure from franchise to provincial, but which still looks franchisey to me? Um, and also this new uh, future tours program that everyone's talking about, where the Proteus are only going to play like eleven Test matches in two years. Um, is white ball cricket where it's at, or is do you still want to play? Do are you still harboring thoughts of red ball cricket? Okay, to start to start off, I think the obviously the game. I mean, you there's T Twenty leagues around the world everywhere now, um, so the T Twenty game has rapidly increased over the last couple of years. I think what also what that also does is. Um, you know, uh, schedules are becoming really busy for some players and, and time frames are limited, uh, you know, for people's seasons and stuff. But just to go on the transition from Division 2 and 1 from the, the setup that we had, I think it's a, it was a great initiative. Um, I feel like the promotion relegation thing really gives the Division 2 players something to play towards. Um, and also, then there's the never a dead rubber when it comes down mm. to a, if you fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth on the log and you're not playing in the semis or finals or whatever the case is, uh, it really makes the value of each game uh, important because that could become, that's the difference between placing sixth and eighth and getting one or two points and getting zero points. So I think it's really important. Um, and I think it's been a great initiative by Cricket South Africa because it gives our Division Two players something to play for. And it makes sure that Division One players can't get comfortable and that you have to always, you know, mm. make sure that you, you're winning, even if it is down to the last game of the season, because you don't want to be that team that gets relegated this season. 
Um, so I think it does increase the competition and the standard of the game uh, at Division One. Um, and then, yeah, to go to the schedule for the pro tiers, I, I, you know, I don't play for the pro tiers, so I wouldn't know their schedule and, and how it is on their bodies <laughs> and stuff like that. But I can tell you one thing is that it is sad to see test cricket, us getting less test games. Um, I mm. think being a, a country that's so strong in test cricket at the moment, I think being referred on the, te the test championship, um, I mean, that's like, it's quite uh, heartbreaking to see that we are only playing. I mean, you playing five, if you play every game for five, five years, you're only going to play less than 30 games. I mean, that's... Mm. It's quite frustrating for people that only play for test cricket. Um, and I feel like test cricket is, is such a pure game, considering there's so much T20 cricket around. Um, it can really test your skills and, you know, it's. I still like to refer, refer to it as like proper cricket. It's like, it really tests you as a which is just my opinion. So... Um, I'm sure some guys that only have to bowl four overs instead of 24 overs <laughs> would much more prefer, prefer 2020 cricket. But um, I really do enjoy um, all formats. But I mm. think t uh, cricket is really a pure format and I love watching it and playing 40 cricket. So, But yeah, it, it is what it is and I suppose there's nothing you can do about it. So um, yeah, uh, I think us only playing seven first-class games again comes down to our schedules. That it's just so mm. jam-packed that there's probably not enough space to work in more games. But hopefully, over time, Cricket South Africa and the people that plan the stuff will be able to get us to play. You know, maybe you know a, a double header. You know, play a home and away game for first-class cricket. Um, I think that would be really cool because then yes. we end up playing. Instead of seven first loss games, we're playing, 14. you know, 14, 14 first loss games in a season, which would, which would be awesome. Um, even if it's, even if it's maybe, uh, you know, where you're only playing, you know, ten games in a season, because yes. that's what we used to play, where you can maybe play five away, five home games, or something along those lines. I mean, it's not, it's above my pay grade, but um, uh, I, I do think seven games is just, it's just a little bit too little because if you. Mm. Maybe a player that gets injured or something, you have a niggle, you miss three games, and you only play four for first class games in a season, which is really not a lot. Um, mm. So I, I really hope that's somewhere where we can improve in South Africa, like maybe play a little bit more first class cricket. But to, in saying that, I'm just really stoked that we can go into a season without COVID, without bubbles, without, and we can just have a normal season again. Um, I think it's been so difficult as a player. I've really found it hard. Um, having to leave home and play at one, three weeks in a row or two weeks in a row, it's been mm. really hard. But in saying that, it, you know, it creates a good little to, to create those bi bubbles so that we can actually have cricket, which is a blessing mm. as well. So, but on the bright side, we can have a normal season and we can, you know, play home and away games and have some crowd back, uh, you know, oh. people back in the stadiums. I think that is just, that's such a blessing in itself. And I think we as cricketers appreciate that a lot more now. Mm. And that was a beautiful I, answer, I, Marcus. Yeah, I agree with everything you said there. Everything you said. Um, I would love to be a, a, have a have home and away, particularly in the full day stuff. Um, I'd love to be able to, if they could fit that in at, at some stage. Um, Start the uh, season earlier. <laughs> Indeed, start, start, start earlier. Um, but also what you said about the competitive nature of, of the two divisional system, it, it definitely has improved things. Um, I, I agree entirely. Um, I can't let you go without asking your thoughts on the T20 competition that we're going to be launching in January. Um, was going to America, did that play a part in, in your thinking that you wanted to maybe um, try a different country to uh try a few things out in that particular format with the with that competition coming up is it a competition that you're looking forward to because obviously we're going to have uh, overseas players coming over um so it's not just south african players like it was um last season what are your thoughts around around, around the competition as a whole um yeah, I think I'm so delighted for just for cricket in South Africa, um, being a cricket lover and a player. Um, 
just seeing that they've managed to do this is at such a large scale. I feel like it's so long overdue for us to have a tournament like this. And I really hope that it's going to be a success. Um, and I'm sure it will be. Uh, I feel like it's run really well now and, and the way they're doing things. And just, I know it's only just, they're just giving us little tastes of it, which is nice. Um, and I think we're all just really excited for the tournament to happen. Um, being involved in the MSL two years ago, mm. um, we got to play with a couple of like overseas players. And I remember playing with Liam Livingston, mm. um, a couple of Pakistani guys, Wabriyas, Asif Ali, Navas. And we had mm. uh, our local players, which are in the best in the world. We had Dale Stain, Nokia, um, Quinton Lecoq in our team. So that's, that's just to name a couple. Of There's about seven international players. And as a youngster or at the time, and a lot of other players, I think when you play with those type of players again, you see the standard that and the high standards that they set and the intensity that they play at. And that can only make us local players uh, a lot better and show us where or what standard, you know, you want to be playing at. So, and you learn a lot from them as well, because I remember, you know, I've become good friends with Liam Livingston and, and he's, his thought process and and the way how and how much they teach you you know just having a chat to them or having a drink with them mm. or and 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 them teaching you a lot more and and where you can improve as a player especially as a local player still um and 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 just is seeing how they go about their things their routines and and you learn a lot and i think it's going to be an awesome tournament um look it's still got we still have a draft system and there's not it's available uh, for local players, but you know, uh, hoping fingers crossed that I can get into the tournament because I think it would be an awesome thing to be involved in. Um, and there's going to be the best players in each team for over the six teams. So I can tell you now that the quality of cricket is going to go through the roof because we've got really talented and some really good players in South locally. So we're having, you know, mixing the local talent with all our international players and overseas players is going to be a top-notch tournament and probably one of the best tournaments in the world. So I'm really looking forward to it, even if that's playing or being part of it or just watching it. I'm really excited for it. I think it's going to be an awesome tournament. Mm. Marcus, um, obviously coming off the couple of years that you've had, um, um, really good cricket and, and, and all the averages that that, you, that you've accomplished, all the things you've accomplished and the scores you've had. What's the what's the goal for you going into the next season and maybe medium term? Um, do you see, um, yeah, like right currently right now the Proteas are looking for middle order batsmen. Do you see yourself as a in the next couple of years, as a person, be like, "Yeah, I'm here. I'm putting my hand up." Well, you're already doing that already, but um, yeah. Well, well, what's the goal? Yeah, I think I think the dream is to play for South Africa, like every other player that plays. Um, I think that's my main goal. I want to obviously get there. Um, I feel like my best chance will probably be in four-day cricket, Test cricket. Um, in saying that, I think that's really that. That's my goal this season. It's just to, you know. And able to reach that dream to play for South Africa, I've got to make sure that I do well at domestic level and keep knocking the door down, putting in good performances. And I think if I can do that, then I will get noticed and hopefully in the future get that um, recognition. Um, but I feel like if I can just keep knocking the door down, keep putting in those good performances, that opportunity might be closer than you think. Um, mm. I think... There's so, like I said, there's so many good players that are competing to try to get into that spot and to try to get into that setup. And because they're such a good team, there's so many good players around. It is a tough team to get into, and that's a good headache and a good place for South African cricket at the moment. So that's definitely the goal, and I really hope I can see myself in there. Um, I haven't given up just yet on that dream, and I think this season I'm more hungry than ever before. So. Yeah, I just really want to do well across all formats. Um, I owe that to myself, I owe that to my team and the people that have invested in me. So, yeah, I'm, I really want to, uh, uh, my mindset's in a good place and I really want to go and uh, have a good season and just show that I am still here and I haven't gone anywhere. Yes, uh, well, look, we sat here with Cyril last year um, and we asked him the same question. Obviously, he was already in and around, but he didn't, I don't think at the time he didn't. He didn't he know hadn't how played. he was going to get. He it. hadn't played. Yeah. We are responsible for getting Cyril a cap. 
<laughs> that's what we did. So hopefully um, that that all the good luck and all the blessings flow to you. And um, I I think you're closer than 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 than, than many people think. And uh, and um, it would be really amazing to see you don the green and gold it, across all formats. If I know you like white ball red ball cricket, but hey, we never know. Um, and and that's the great thing about sport. No, thank you. Just, and, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah go, for it. go ahead. Go ahead, Marcus. No, I, Sorry. No, no you, you go for it first. I'll finish. <laughs> okay. Uh, just, it's just one more for me. It's a, a lighthearted one. Um, if you could take one pitch with you and, and play on it all, 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 the, all time, which would, which would it be? Your, your favorite pitch to bat on? Please don't say Kingsmead. Please don't say Kingsmead. It's definitely not, it, unfortunately. <laughs> I know it's my own ground, but that's not the one pitch I'll take with me. Um, I think if there's one pitch I could take with me, I don't know, it'll probably be... Oh, it's a tough one. I'd probably say Northwest. <laughs> oh, <Zenith> yes. <laughs> <laughs> that pitch is lovely. That pitch just says... Um, right. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a lot... It's a lovely, it's a lovely ground to play at, and it's a lovely, a lovely wicket to bat on. Yes. Well, awesome. Marcus, uh, that brings us to the end of our interview. Thank you very much. Wish you all the best for the new season. Um, I know we start with the T20s, and then we go into uh, four-day cricket, and uh, we'll play the one-day cricket, one-day cup, probably sometime next year. So I wish you all the best. I wish you a full season, no injuries, nothing. We just want to see runs, my man. Um, you've got a backing from us. I'm not a big Dolphins fan, but after today, I might just have a soft spot for them. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I wish you all the best. <laughs> yeah, no, awesome. I'm glad I convinced you to become a Dolphins supporter. And um, <laughs> and hopefully um, you got a lot more respect for um, Sinstidians after after the, the weekend. <laughs> um, but uh, thanks, thanks again for having me. I really appreciate that. And, yeah, um, hopefully I'll see you guys around sometime. I appreciate it. Sure, no. Thank you very much, Marcus. Awesome. Have a great day. Thanks, Marcus. Thank you so Thank you. much. Keep on. Okay, bye. And Tim, that was an interview. That was an amazing interview. Um, thank you very much for organizing that. I love that. I think he's closer than, than many people think. I think if you are looking for a middle order option, you know, even in SAA, if you're looking for a middle order option, I, I, you don't need to look far. Um, those numbers look, say yeah. say say quite a lot, and he's been consistent and uh, good head on his shoulders. Really lovely guy, and I think look if 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 we need if we need help in the middle order, I'm more comfortable that he's probably next in line. He may not know yeah. It yet, but yeah, or maybe he does. He just don't want to tell us. But really great interview, Tim. Yeah. Look, um, his numbers, his numbers don't lie. If you if you looked at uh, Sawa's numbers before he came into the Protus setup, mm. they weren't that different. They weren't that different. You know, forty the last few seasons, forty one, thirty six, and fifty two, those are solid, dependable mm. numbers. Uh, if he can have similar similar numbers as he did last season, you know, around the forty five to fifty region, there's no reason why he, he can't get a get a get a a crack in in that middle mm. order. We've got two middle order guys who are struggling for various reasons. It's it's a possibility. It's definitely a possibility. I'm a fan. I really am a fan. Thank you very much. Mm. Remember, that's the end of our show. We'll be back um, uh, with with more regular programming, more interviews as we lead down into um, the, the the start of the season. The dates are out. We've got the CSA T20 starting up first, um, and then we're going to go into four-day cricket, and we'll be bringing you a show weekly, but most importantly, sometimes we'll be bringing you uh, interviews. So please do join us and uh, be with us there. Remember, you can tweet us at One World SR. You can also comment on Facebook. You can like. You can uh, do a lot of things on Facebook that are positive, um, and we, we love that. You can also, um, you can also uh, support us at Patreon. We've got a Patreon account to help us keep greasing these wheels as we go along. But thank you very much, Tim. And thank you to Marcus. Um, and yeah, have a great day, everybody. And yeah, goodbye. And les sale kakakiso.